World War II shaped the lives of a generation. The war broke families apart, brought communities together, and turned a depressed economy into an industrial machine. On the home front, citizens sold war bonds and collected scrap metal for the factories. Friends were made and lost as a generation of boys was sent into combat. Penn State Public Broadcasting invited those who lived this history to share their stories of World War II. My name is Paul Cosella. <clears throat> I should mention I was born in Brooklyn. You know, when I was two years old, my peasant, peasant parents couldn't foresee the war. Um, and they figured they were here as immigrants working, making enough money to go back and, you know, live better. Uh, so in 1936, I think it was, yeah, 36, uh, my father sent my mother and myself back to Slovakia to start building a house and all that. <clears throat> and then my sister was born there. And then the, the war broke out and my father got stuck here, we got stuck over there. So that's how I came to, to be there. They were not with the Germans because Germans invaded, you know, they, they just came in and filled up the pastures with airplanes and trucks and and occupied, you know, like there were five, six of them, real smart, dressed Nazi soldiers living in every house. So we had about five, six of them living in our house. And most of them were young kids in, you know, Nazi uniforms. And so the allegiance was whoever whoever was stronger, I guess. Our real allegiances were with the fathers and, and their young sons who left the villages and joined the partisans in, in the mountains. The most famous partisans were the Italian and the French resistance. They were also called the partisans because they formed groups to uh, harass or kill and uh, just raise hell with the Germans. The entire village's allegiances was with whatever the partisans were doing. Right. Okay. And they were obviously sympathetic with the Russians who were coming, coming someday, they would be coming. As a matter of fact, the story was that one of them who didn't speak, one of those partisans who didn't speak our dialect, he spoke you know, hard Russian. and so that these guys were supposedly dropped by by the Russians, parachuted into the woods and, and, and formed groups, joined groups as, you know, resistance. Okay. So the allegiance was with those guys. And they would sneak down at night and gather food because there's, there's nothing in the forest. There's November, October, November, December, November at that time and uh, and and the Germans knew that these guys were being supported by their civilians and there were a couple of out of towners these two guys one guy was a shoemaker another guy was I don't know what the heck he was but they were constantly up on the hill and sort of looking for the German patrols to come by and they were they were collaborators with the with the they they like told everything that was happening, and of course the villagers found out that these guys were informing the Ger and the telling Germans they were meeting them they would and one night the few partisans that were up there came down took took them up in the thing and we found them after the war they were both shot in the back of the head right. Just in the, just barely in the woods. Actually, just their children and their wives recognized the clothing because they were just skeletons by then. Yeah. But that's uh, you. You could you were on the <coughs> horns of a dilemma. You could not screw around with the Germans because 
when the Germans said, okay, you got to tell us when, you, you got to let us know when these sneak attacks are going to happen so our patrols don't get wiped out. So, of course, nobody, nobody would cooperate with them. So they simply took 10 elders, the elders from three villages, lined them up against the wall and just mowed them down like, like sitting ducks. Eventually, at first they were just taking all the Jews. Wherever there was a family of Jews, they just disappeared on back of trucks and never, you never saw them again. But later on, as the Russians got closer and closer, they were taking whole villages and shipping them someplace. The few escapees that, you know, said they ended up in slave labor camps making munitions in Germany and all that. So to avoid that, to avoid the whole village to, to be taken, um, the town father says, we got to head up into the mountains, dig holes in size of cave, like caves, and stay there as long as we have to. Take your pigs, your cows, or whatever. So, so we did a whole village, did that. And that's when uh, the partisans really were these dubious friends. I mean, they were our friends, but they were eating us out of house and home, you know, because they just didn't have any supplies. So we moved up there with the two, two cows, the dog, and everything, else, and lived in these dugouts. Okay. It constantly rained and sleet, snow. It was extremely... Yeah, just miserable weather. We stayed in a, in a village as long as, I mean, up in the woods as long as you could. And eventually, running out of food, snow coming, there was no thing. So we, we would sneak down to the village and, and get potatoes and stuff. And then eventually we realized the Germans, are not, they're, they're, they're not interested in this little village. So the whole village came back into town. And that's when, and then all of a sudden, the Germans reversed their uh, thing, and they said they showed up one early morning with trucks and horse carts, and with evacuating everybody, everybody in, into trucks and stuff, and just leaving everything behind. And um, actually, my mom was running around the yard with this little piece of rope. I actually wrote a short story after after what's called the the rope uh, irony, because she's crying because she doesn't have a, a, a piece of rope long enough to string more dishes on it, right? And there's a young Nazi walking around, mimicking her, laughing, you know, we you crazy, right? And me, like a jerk, you know, I say, you don't make fun, so I go and kick him. And I was barefoot, and this guy had boots. He couldn't have hurt him. But next thing I'm, I'm looking down into into this little black horse. And, oh, shit, is this going to hurt? He's going to shoot me. And then the, the actually, one of the Germans who was mentioned, he's yelled something in German. So the guy put his thing away. And, uh, but anyway, into the big city and into cattle cars. Actually, cattle cars, you know, with cow shit everywhere and a little bit of straw. And the train is just going and going. And like I think I told you part of this. At, at one point, the train stopped like, uh, it, it stopped in a rainstorm. And um, the guy came by and said, um, any dead bodies in there? You know, the, the reason the train stops is to get the dead bodies out. And that's where my, my mom snuck out. She jumped out of the after the guy left. He, he didn't lock the door, so the door was open. She, she jumped out, and you know, we walked across this incredible, long, well, it, it seemed long because we expected to get shot any second, across towards the station. And then we realized, oh, that's why they didn't give a shit about this train full of civilians, because there's a troop train that just came from the Russian front, complete. It looked like meat wagons with human beings screaming, legs, arms, you know, just wound, blood dripping down from the thing into the rain. 
So they paid attention more to that train, you know, trying to get these poor souls off the... All, all wounded Germans shut up, bleeding to the dying. So we ended up, we sort of hit in the station, and then finally the station master sort of like recognized my mother from... Someone is a little girl or something. And she said, yeah, 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 I'm one of the Stash family. He said, well, he told us how said, you get, there's going to be a train going back this way. Now you get into the last car and just stay there. Just, you know. And it was an empty train going back in, in this other direction. I remember riding the back, the tail end, watching the telephone. Uh, telephone uh, and as we went every over every bridge, as we went over a bridge, it was the it was actually the last train and the tracks. Uh, I, I, my sister and I said, "Oh look how the smoke curls when when oh look how uh, you know they they already had the charges set that was the last train." So you know there were so many close calls and I, I say if we weren't on that train who the hell knows we probably wouldn't have probably wouldn't have made it I don't know. We were trying to walk back that night and the guys they were like civilian guys guards. You don't you don't walk at night. So they, they shoot. There's a curfew. They're shooting everybody along. The, so we stayed in the station until overnight, and then walked to Grandpa's place. And then we waited for the front. That's where we were in this little thatched roof, looking over this enormous pasture. And the Germans decided th that they were going to pull back because there were mountains back there, and they had uh, cement bunkers in, 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 in and stuff. But they were so as the Germans came across this huge pasture, they started to to bombard the artillery right over the village, and I mean they just horizon filled with Russian infantry with their Tommy guns and stuff. Actually, filled. It looked like undulating, like you know, just and and the artillery shells dropping amongst them, and then they just rose up in this, like almost a song. It was like a song or a battle cry or whatever. And they ran up towards us, you know, towards this canal, and hit. And they said, "Okay, now we're going to get because the Russians are coming into this village, and the Germans are just simply going to lift up there too, and they're going to bombard." And as soon as the Russians hit that canal, artillery stopped. Of course, Grandma and Mom is on their knees praying, doing the rosaries, and I said, "You see the power of prayer? You see, we stopped the bombardment." They said, "Yeah, yeah, Grandma, good." Uh, but they didn't. They just stopped. And everybody's giving them bacon and bread, and because they were the liberators, they were, they were, they they got the Nazis, you know, ch chasing the Germans. And the, 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 the most frequent question was, could I do Berlino? Which way is Berlin? They want to know. These mixed up guys, you know, shell shocked. They said, which way is Berlin? They want to get to Berlin as fast as they could because they all had you know, been in the war for five, six years, I guess. It was. Uh, life in Slovakia was uh, all the fields were mined. The Germans left. I must have lost. I must have lost. 14, 16 classmates in landmines uh, explosion. Two or three of them are still living, hobbling around on one leg because the, most of them were infantry mines, just tore off one leg and left you there. We had this one commandment from mom. Do not, you know where the mines is, do not, because a lot of my jerky friends would go up and try to disarm them to get the to get the uh, blasting caps, and then you could use that as a firecracker. In you know, you know, a twelve-year-old mom had these fairy tales about different flowers, how God made this, and how God made made the little fo blue forget-me-nots. But we still had to get ration tickets for shoes, so she sent me to get these ration tickets. It was like three villages away. So on my way back, I noticed this field, and. and Oh my God! It was full of forget-me-nots, right? So, so oh man, Mom's gonna be so happy. I bring her some. So I wander in there, and I go further, further, picking up the long stem, you know, forget-me-nots. And I'm way back in there when I realize, oh, here's a Russian soldier, leg missing. He's he's sort of, you know, to the side. His eyeballs are rotted out. He's, he's 
stepped on a mine and uh, died. Nobody came to me. But wait a second, that's where I am. I'm in a freaking minefield. And the road's way to hell over there. <clears throat> I said, now I'm trying to retrace my steps. And, and, and Okay, let's see. If there's a mine, it's probably the grass doesn't grow as green. So it's a, oh, oh, should I put my foot here or put my foot there? I remember, you know, like it took a year to get out of there. It, it would have Hail Mary with every step in there. Our Father, every, oh, no, 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 finally, yeah, I did make it. I went... I made the last lunge, a huge, big step, and sort of, I still remember laughing and crying at the same time, when I still had this bundle of forget-me-nots in my hand. War sucks, no matter how, every chicken, every blade of grass, every tree, every barn was affected by the war. There's no such thing, oh, I'll be neutral, I'll be 